and welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy, and I'm excited to be with you all today. For our listeners, those who are on the YouTube, this may be a day where you might want to I want to think about the video version of the show, Wes. There's going to be some good stuff we're going to be discussing later on as we get into the meat of the show. But uh, I'm excited to uh, to bring an esteemed guest on today. It's going to be a fun one. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. <clears throat> the state of dental implant education. Where are we at today, John? We've got a very special guest that's near and dear to our heart. We'll get to that just in a minute. Hey, don't forget, you can text the dental guys at 865-544-8954. Um, we won't get to text today because we're going to be busy with our guests, but uh, thank you so much to those that have been reaching out to us by text. Super pumped to hear from you. And if we uh, see something that's worthy of the show um, or just interesting, we'll bring mm-hmm. it on and super pumped about that. The Dental Guys is brought to you by John, the Dental Crafters Network. And longtime sponsor of the Dental Guys podcast. We love the Dental Crafters Network. As you know, um, one relationship with the Dental Crafters Network where possibilities are truly infinite. Um, Family owned, full service dental laboratory. They collaborate closely with dentists to understand and meet their unique needs in today's ever changing dental industry choose the Dental Crafters Network. Now, John, this is why we choose the Dental Crafters Network, because it is a U.S.-based laboratory that is owned. We know the owner. He's he's a dental geek. You know him as Brad, the dental lab guy, and we are so pumped. Brad has been with us, the dental guys, since the very beginning, and really, really appreciate Brad and his company, the Dental Crafters Network, for investing in the dental guys so that we can get out next level dentistry to you and bring on guests like today. So where your vision meets innovation, that is the Dental Crafters Network. Visit dentalcrafters.net or call 1-800-472-8302. And John, don't forget to mention the Dental Guys and get 10% off your first case. Right. It's big. And the Dental Guys is also brought to you by Restorative Driven Implants, Have you been looking to integrate implant dentistry into your practice? We're going to be talking about this today with our guest about the state of dental implant education. Well, I can tell you, if you choose the right continuum and the right organizations, you can get some great dental implant education. And restorative driven implants, we believe, is one of those you should be looking at. Live patient experiences, research-based education on both the surgical and restorative aspects of dental implants. If, if you are looking to implement dental implants into your practice, you should definitely be checking out RDI, Restorative Driven Implants. If you're interested, call them at 715-207-9517, restorativedriveninimplants.com. And Wes, I think, you know, once again, thank you to our sponsors for mm. supporting us because they allow us to bring you the great content that we do. And I think before we introduce our guest, Wes, it's it's important to go back sometimes. Let's go back. And right before we got on the show, we asked our guest, Dr. Clark Stanford, we said, you know, just to be sure, we we seem to remember you from somewhere. Now, I I say that only because we've obviously talked to Dr. Stanford on the show before, both at the AO meeting as well as on the show separately. But there was a memory that we had of him Mm -hmm. from, I think it was 2012. And the reason I know that is because for those of you who don't know the story of the dental guys, how we met, we met in another country. Even though we only practice about an hour from each other, it took going to Sweden for the AstroTech World Congress in 2012 for us to actually meet each other. And for those of you who are dentists, you know dentists are weird, real weird. Mm. And when someone says to you, hey, I got this guy that I want you to meet and I want you to hang out with. <laughs> And we're going to another country and we're just going to basically lock you guys in a room and hang out at this meeting. I remember thinking, oh, man, this is probably going to be really terrible. I mean, the meeting I was excited about, but then I meet Wes and the rest is history. But in the in the time there, we met some very interesting people, people that we'd been reading their articles, people that we had been following their research. And there were two people in particular that I remember being excited about seeing there. One was Lyndon Cooper. 
because we've been following Lyndon's research and especially things like, you know, zirconia, uh, uh, full art zirconia restorations with implants. And also it was Dr. Stanford. And so it was interesting to look back and think, man, Wes, I mean, think about all of the, the, the time, you know, we were such, we were, we were young in our implant knowledge in some ways, but somehow we ended up around some of the smartest people on the planet in Sweden. What a crazy time. I mean, Sweden, the birthplace, you know, of like dental implants, you know, and yeah. I remember John and I just meeting each other and then we were like, how are you connected? And then we started talking about just what we were interested in and found out that we were both like, you know, really geeking out about dental implants early on in our career and um, had followed a lot of the same people and implant education across uh, the world. And, um, and it was really an amazing meeting. I remember uh, Dr. Stanford being there and um, on stage. Also, I remember seeing, not to disregard others that were there because there was many clinicians. Uh, Dr. Picos was there. I remember um, our oral surgeon and I, we were like, we had some questions for Dr. Picos and we tracked mm -hmm. him down. I remember we stopped him in the middle of the hallway. It was like, hey, can we talk to you? And you know what's great is that, yeah, they wanted to talk to us. And that was what's cool. And every time I get to know some of these clinicians and professors, it really, there are people just like you that are practicing dentistry today. And if you're in dental school today, sometimes you're blinded by just the requirements. You know, if you're listening to this and you're in dental school, you're like, man, I just can't see anything but the end of the road. I've got to get out and get done. But what you really come to recognize is that these are dentists. These are people that are truly interested in one, you know, you know, trying to advance dentistry. Some of these advanced techniques that we talk about on the show were started in universities. We're started actually on paper towels at some mm -hmm. of these meetings. You know, that's another thing that's cool is a lot of the innovation that we see starts with collaboration. And I appreciate um, the Academy of Osseo Integration and the relationship we've had with them over the years. And hooking us up with people like Dr. Stanford today, who is um, really um, an amazing clinician and has really pushed forward research. I know his relationship with uh, Dr. Lyndon Cooper, who is one of our favorite people when it comes to bone and all the research that he did on bone early on and and especially with the Astrotech implant. And uh, so we really appreciate uh, Dr. Stanford for coming on the show tonight and talking about the state of dental implant education. Welcome to the show, Dr. Stanford. Hey, good. Hi, John and Wes. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah. Doing very well. So, doing uh, very well. So this is a big topic. Um, where would you like to start the race? <laughs> well, I think a good place to start is where we, what inspired us to, to contact you to discuss this topic was an AO Academy News newsletter. Now, the Academy of Austin Integration, for those of you who don't know, publishes a quarterly newsletter where they focus on topics ranging from some, you know, basic research reviews all the way to just some kind of fun discussions on on, on what you know, kind of the what should we be doing, and also featuring kind of what programs they've got going on. And this particular issue, when you see an issue with a title that says the state of dental implant education. We pay attention to that. And there were several excellent both clinicians as well as educators that were featured and uh, not, not the least of which was, was you. And so when we started reading through some of the discussion and we started reflecting on some of the things you said, uh, it really got us thinking. So I guess maybe just as the dean of the dental school and someone who has a ton of background in the research and clinical side, what is the state of dental implant education in our schools today? Let's start with the schools, maybe in the, you know, say the, the, the doctoral program, just the dental school, if we're going that route first, before we talk about specialties, because I think that's what a lot of our listeners want to hear about is, 
where are we now? How, where have we progressed? Where are we still maybe in needing work? So uh, thank you, John. So um, it's, the best way to describe this today is the fact that um, the one thing that we have to get through to our students is the fact that they need to have a good comprehensive dental education in terms of restorative, perio, surgical, um, and of course, diagnostics. That's easy to say, but each of those areas is rapidly changing in and of themselves. So when we talk about implant dentistry, that is actually in some ways what I would like to refer to as tooth replacement at the end of a pretty long process of understanding the diagnostics, the risks, the surgical management of the patient, as well as the prosthetic or rehabilitation of that. We can teach some of that using the conventional approaches, at least theoretical concepts. But I'll use an example. For some students, they think a dental implant, at least on the surgical side, is you basically um, scan the patient, drill a hole, drop the, 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 the titanium screw in, and voila, you're done. When in fact, what we have to teach is the fundamentals of, for instance, periodontology, things like how much attached mucosa do you have? What's the thickness of the mucosa? What augmentation procedures will you need to create a safe and long-term implant restoration? Um, and so really what we've been doing in dental education is focusing on those basics um, so that those principles will come through knowing that yes, they will have surgical experiences in dental school. They will have of course prosthetic experiences for implant therapy in dental school. But these are really kind of, if you will, the, they are at the beginning of the horse race. They actually have to understand all of the issues that they are gonna have to face in terms of creating a predictable implant uh, outcome for their patients if they choose to do surgical approach. But they also have to understand <laughs> what they don't know. And that is probably the hardest part of dental education is because so many times students want to run before they've actually learned to proverbially walk. And you know, that that's when they, it's nice to do that in dental school because you can get yourself into trouble and there's a safety net to help you. When you're out in private practice and that happens, you either have to refer to a specialist and kind of work through that problem or issues or you have to work out the situation with the patient and that often is a loss of let's just say resources for your practice including at the very best your time as well as your um, sleeping at night so one of the things that we really focused on in dental education in the past few years is um, assessing from the periodontal and and of course the osseous support for a potential site and then blending into that using digital workflows today so that if they choose to do the surgical phase, they know at least what is the anatomic and relatively the physiologic uh, area that they're going to be working in. So they may be able to make a strategic referral to a specialist to help them uh, in achieving the best result for their patient. I'm not sure if I'm answering your yeah, question directly. You're, you're John, getting but, there. Yeah. And I but, think- but this is, well, I use an example. I was just um, at the AAPAO summit that they just held in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. And one of the outcomes of that was suggesting that something that maybe I thought or I didn't really think that much about 20, 25 years ago, and that was how close did my restoration start from the head of the implant? Because I went through at the era when UCLA restorations, you know, uh, uh, implant level crown was considered in the aesthetic zone, probably the optimal approach. And here we were looking at um, systematic review data now suggesting we really need to move that restorative margin away from the head of the implant, especially on a bone level implant. Mm -hmm. And that means really for the large majority of aesthetic single tooth implants, we're talking about at least uh, some type of augmentation of that soft tissue mm -hmm. to be able to create a predictable long-term result. Um, and even that, you know, 
it, it does a general dental student have that range of surgical finesse at that point in their education to fully understand all of what they're getting themselves into? Um, well, and of yeah, course, that, we know yeah. the answer is no, right? We know the answer is no, uh, and that's okay. I mean, I, I think the question is how coming, you know, walking yeah, into but oral how, surgery. You know, you made the, you, Right. You made the comment in the same Academy news that, that goes right to what you're saying, which is, do we, you know, many of these students who have this interest in the surgical placement of implants mm -hmm. for whatever reason, whether that's because it's, you know, they look at it as financially something that could be good for them or whether they just think it's sexy. They look, you know, see it on social mm -hmm. media, whatever it might be. But in the end, do they, you made the comment, do, do they know how to lay a flap? Do they know how to manage a flap? Do they know uh, how to suture? Do they know how to look at, you know, the amount of attached tissue around an implant and what's required? And I think, as you said, as we're moving more into a different way of thinking about the biology of implants, let alone the treatment planning of the restorative, which we haven't even touched on, you know, there's a lack of even at the, a high level of surgery, we have surgeons that struggle with, say, connective tissue grafting that might not have been trained in that or might not do it every day. And so to your mm -hmm. point, you know, we've talked about this on the show multiple times. But once you understand you need a certain amount of soft tissue above an implant, potentially, a la Linkovicious at all, then you start to mm -hmm. think about should we drive the implant deeper, right, to create that soft tissue? Uh, quote unquote, or should we augment the soft tissue? And just that discussion there that we're having, just those few words, think of all of what you need to know mm -hmm. to join in on that conversation. That's just the conversation, let alone where do I insert my 15C blade? And what do I do? And what's a split thickness flap and a full thickness flap? And how do I reflect it? And how do I not you know, damage things. And I think that, you know, now you hear the cries from the other side, which is that folks say, hey, I have, I'm graduating with half a million dollars in debt, Dr. Stanford. Mm -hmm. And I've got to find a way to make that make sense in my practice. How do you respond to those types of discussions when you have, say, new graduates or students or you know, folks that are trying to navigate this world of looking at implant dentistry as a higher production procedure, and how does that relate back to wh what we do, or do we change anything about dental education? So what I would say, John, is um, if you are driving your practice based on a uh, pure sense of revenue um, and versus patient care. Um, you have to kind of sometimes step back and think to yourself, if you treat your patients right, you'll do fine. Um, it's really coming back to what I like to say is know your limits because it's gonna cost you a lot more in the long run if you misdiagnose or you dive in to the deep end before you're ready. And so, you know, start with the straightforward and I have, I'm not, you know, more general dentist place implants than all the surgical specialties together. So the reality is it's not what it was in the, the late eighties and that's fine. Um, but it's also, I'll use an example. What we teach our students is if you want to start, start at something like an overdenture, start at something that's a like a mandibular posterior implant with a CBCT um, or in uh, or a maxillary posterior, don't start with number eight. Don't start with something that even a highly skilled surgeon is going to have their hair up on the back of their neck. And that comes back to take take this the what we um, what the ITI refers to as the simple quote unquote mm -hmm. in the SAC it's, classification so start there in a biologically healthy ASA one patient make sure the patient understands you know where you are on the learning curve so you, there's no preconceived notions of um, you know some sort of sense of advanced expertise but also know that you're building experience and we do that. 
Um, you know, I tell my students, I, I graduated as a prosthodontist in um, a long time ago, but um, it, I would say by 10 years out, I kind of felt, okay, I've kind of seen everything that could come my way. And I kind of figured out how I could address each of those. And that took 10 years of progressively um, expanding that to, to uh, being able to feel comfortable with um, both predicting where I can go, but also knowing how to get myself out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Or if I knew I was starting to get into trouble, how I could stop and not make a irreversible, um, I don't want to say mistake, but an irre go down a primrose path where um, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to lose a lot of money. The patient's going to be upset. And in today's social media world, an upset, as you both, Wes and John know, uh, one upset patient can create a lot of havoc in social media if you if you're not really careful about communicating exactly what are clear expectations of outcomes. So coming back to that, your point about debt and debt load and management versus something like implants, there are lots of different things that we can do in dentistry that are, I would argue, lower risk until you are more comfortable. I'll use an example. How many dental students finish dental school totally savvy in tooth extractions? I would argue there are few in my few that graduate with more than 300 teeth that they've removed, which I find a little bit funny, but they they do. Um, and so this is the idea: if you're if you can lay a flap and remove a wisdom tooth, or lay a flap and get a um, highly decayed number 19 out of the bone without de destroying the facial plate then you are demonstrating a surgical skill set that prepares you for the challenges with uh, implant dentistry on the surgical side um, and that's where you know just do the basics first get yourself totally comfortable then start to venture stepwise into these more advanced areas um, and I would be very upfront with your surgical colleagues so they know if if Clark's going to start placing implants, he's going to he's going to take the the maybe the more straightforward ones if there is such a thing. And the surgical folks will still get the bigger cases that you're working on. And so you kind of feed each other um, in that way. Um, and that's where I see with a lot of prosthodontists that place implants they struggle sometimes with that referral network and how the referral network views them. Um, and so that's one of those things where you have to make that conscious decision in your practice. Um, what is your, how risk adverse are you or how, you know, risk taking are you, um, you know? The opportunity we have right now in dental education, really because of the time period we're at, <clears throat> with dental implants. There's a certain amount of stability in science right now. Um, maybe not with periimplantitis or perimucositis, as you've heard us talk about on the podcast and all the things that are coming out about that. But from a standpoint of the surgical techniques, we seem to have kind of unified around a type of implant body that seems to be kind of a standard root form implant. We've moved away from quote unquote external connections for the most part and move to a more internal platform. We understand that, again, there are certain like, basically we have predicates. We have enough mm -hmm. information now that we can teach a standard, a standard of care. And so how has that impacted the ability to teach dental implants? And in, in education today, you being a dean, and being a part of a greater network of dental schools. How are these, this seems like we have some what of a standard of care that we didn't have 20 years ago whenever I first cut my teeth on dental implant placement and restoring. Now we, we have a certain amount of systems and we know, you know, things that are right, things that are wrong. We could argue about some minutiae. Obviously, you were talking about one earlier and margin placement. But even in, the, even in that, we can come back to a standard and 
just like we have a standard in a crown prep or a bridge prep or some type of restoration material choice and how we go about these things. Tell me how that's helping you set our new dentist graduating now to kind of be ready to at least know how to talk about it with their specialist. Sure. Um, well, I'm going to use an example we're doing at the University of Iowa West, if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks, the, great. Um, so one of the things we do is we start in the D1 year where they have um, the intro to oral surgery and they have an intro to the surgical phase of implant care. Um, and that moves into their first full course in the second year, which is digital implant treatment planning and digital implant placement and they actually place implants on a um, on a jaw that's been cbct scanned they go through the the diagnostic evaluation in this in the scanning software that we um, use and then they plan out the printed guide which we print and then they go ahead and place and restore this is all using one unified workflow from mm. assessment all the way through to restoration that is the exact same workflow they then use with their first set of patients in the latter part of their second year and then into their third year and fourth year. So we've harmonized, that's my term, um, the, uh, across the four years use and implant therapy is a great place to harmonize a standard protocol mm -hmm. across the four years across. I have 10 departments in my college, so I've been able to standardize this across the 10 departments so that what the students are learning at the pre-doctoral level for implant care is a unified approach so they understand all of the risks of where the implant is placed, where the uh, which abutment, what they want for architectural design of the transition zone of the abutment, what to look for, what to look for when it's not done right. So that's part of the competency evaluations. And then how to do, how to use a core file, how to mill their own crown to that they will then place on that, um, and we do screw mentable is principally what we teach at the pre-doctoral level, how they go about, and so they're taught how to do that whole screw mentable cementation approach um, with the milled crown. And yes, it, it's a, it's a cost-effective for us as a dental school standardizing that protocol because nothing frustrates a dean more than in inefficiencies when students are not taught something consistent and then all that happens is in a novice provider they become confused and they throw their hands up in frustration mm -hmm. um the challenge for dental education with implant therapy is sometimes our accreditation standards haven't exactly caught up mm -hmm. so when you might have a missing number 19 perfect site for um, a single tooth implant, and yet the accreditation standards dictate that we still have to teach clinically fixed partial dentures. We end up in sometimes some um, ethical conflicts in the clinic where does the patient, and for us, we set the price the same. The price mm -hmm. of an implant is the same as a fixed partial denture, but we get caught where um, more patients want implant therapy than want the conventional dental bridge. And yet our licensing boards and our accrediting agency still assumes that we will be teaching to competency something that in some ways uh, there are, yes, I'm a process. Yes, I like doing fixed partial dentures in, when it's necessary, but I think we're still a little bit stuck in uh, dental education stuck from the point of view of what is the licensing boards looking for? Mm. What are the uh, what are the accrediting agencies requiring to the point that some dental schools and I won't name them, but some dental schools are caught where to to be able to successfully have their students complete the curriculum based on their crediting recommendations from the accrediting agency. They've actually opened up free bridge clinics for people to come in to get a free bridge. So every student gets that clinical experience and voila, they can graduate, which to me is a very strange way of thinking about dental mm -hmm. education that we now have to, so we're still um, caught, you know, dental education wants to be more aggressive in terms of maybe incorporating some of these changes and expanding. 
but we also know that um, licensing boards and states and the accrediting agencies still require you to do certain things that uh, no, uh, that they did 40 years ago. Um, mm. Come, come go so foil. if you had yeah. to, so if you had to, knowing what you know about, and this is this is you know not a perfect question or maybe not a perfect answer, but knowing what you know about the current available technology that we have, both from a plant standpoint and from a prosthetic standpoint, knowing as Wes kind of mentioned that things have become. Mm -hmm maybe a little slower to change with implant designs, maybe a little bit more of like a coalescence of common design features yeah. and things such as that. Maybe some agreement on surgical techniques a little bit more, guided surgery being available, all these things. And knowing what you f see with a traditional four-year dental student being competent at or potentially being competent at surgically, what do you think is a reasonable? Now, this is just from the, this is the Clark Stanford uh, you know, standard here. This is not, you know, accreditation based. It's just, what do you feel that if you could allow for your graduating dental students from an implant dentistry standpoint to have achieved or, or accomplished procedurally by the time they graduate, what would be some of the things that you would say, hey, I would love for all of my graduates to be able to understand or perform the following things mm -hmm. when they graduate dental school at Iowa? Basically, dis, dis, right now, tell us the standard of care that you would like your students to graduate with when it comes to the specialty, because we still call it that, of implant placement and restoration. Okay. Um, so, um, thank you, John West. So, I, uh, the standard of what I would call the standard of practice today is that they understand most importantly the comprehensive diagnosis, both medically of the patient and to truly have a comprehensive diagnostic understanding of the challenges uh, aesthetically as well as um, uh, site development for that particular implant site if that's being treatment plant. That's a core. Second is when you start talking about or basic oral surgery, I want them to be completely comfortable in terms of um, removing teeth, laying flaps, and as you mentioned earlier, proper suturing and proper suture placement and depending on the site. Um, and then where uh, and then we get into the periodontal side, and this is probably where we have a lot of work to do. And this is on for a general dentist in a, in a dental education, what do we teach about augmentation? Yes, the periodontist can come in and talk about here is um, a connective tissue graft, which many still consider the gold standard. What's the positives and the challenges with using, um, which is increasingly more common now, autographs. Um, these are either dermal or uh, embryonic, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, placental membrane um, derived uh, grafting materials. To me, the commoditization in some ways of implant designs has now allowed us to, if you will, standardize pretty much the workflows from a mechanical perspective in terms of how you assemble the parts and maybe install, if you will, the implant. But it's now what I would like the students, and we're not here yet, but I'd like to have the students understand, oh, this site, I will have a better stability if I augment with an autogenous um, uh, dermal graft. Or, oh my gosh, I've now identified this is a less than one millimeter thickness of keratinized tissue. I'm going to have a challenge. I either have to refer and have it and augment it if I don't feel comfortable or prepare yourself to have that augmentation experience. And you can do that with um, before you're getting into implant therapy. You can do that by practicing with surgical extractions, doing site preservation because you're now osseous and soft tissue grafting, proper suturing and then evaluating the outcomes in a healed ridge, not taking the risk of also having installed uh, a dental implant or dental implants 
until you're comfortable predictably seeing the healing from that and where we're at right now is we want to make sure that those students from our surgical phase are very comfortable with handling your standard surgical extraction surgical management um, and then starting to inch into um, the implant placement but that's a tough lift again in a uh, short three to four years of a dental education when you stop and think about it prosthetically is a whole different prosthetically now that's that's much more straightforward now that we're able to use true understanding on custom abutment design and they've already designed that abutment at the time of implant treatment planning and we can then go into the core file so chair side they can actually be milling their provisional if not their final crown uh, on that implant and so they are gaining a either an immediate or an early loading protocol experience and so we can teach them the role of occlusion right at the time that they are doing their second or third implant experience in dental school because they're going to do it and they're going to they're going to do it in the real world outside so we might as well guide them in terms of what to look for and what to watch out for if we can do you feel like that it's still fragmented though. I mean, you have, I mean, what you're doing at Iowa, I mean, one, if you're listening to this and you're from Iowa, I know we have some listeners there. You should feel blessed one to have, you know, Dr. Stanford at the helm and kind of guiding this ship because to be able to unify one, the departments, that's a feat. So congratulations on that feat. Mm -hmm. Cause that's amazing. And so that's a that's a harmony thing that you spoke of that is so key and the consistency because people can sniff out in any organization, you know, disharmony. And this is one of these things that if you're harmonized all the way through postgraduate on how to do things, that's going to be huge. If you're graduating from Iowa, I feel like you're going to be like top of the class when it comes to dental implants, at least having a, some core knowledge and mm -hmm. just like the core file. Um, so the core knowledge that you guys are, are doing in Iowa to me is next level because I don't hear, I don't hear now you're in the know because you're in, you know, the dental education realm and have been for a very long time. How is this proliferating across the country? It, um, well, you know, there, once you've seen one dental school, you've seen one dental school, as the joke goes amongst the dental deans, <laughs> is each school is a little bit different. They each have their strengths. Um, what we're seeing is um, there is a demand curve from students uh, wanting to make sure that they have uh, both the uh, implant experience because they hear about it in social media, they hear about it, and they may even have one themselves very more, more mm -hmm. commonly today. Um, and they know that the entire field is changing with, you know, just think of the time since you graduated from dental school, mm -hmm. how much now we do digitally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, little did I think even 15 years ago that I could take a picture with my iPhone uh, of someone's face and then from there drop it into the software and actually map out a completely new smile versus having to pick up a PK instrument and start waxing off uh, gypsum casts. I mean, it's, it's the, the rapidity, the rate at which technologies are coming into dental practice is, and we haven't even talked about AI and the advent of what that's going to do to help support um, dentists in their practice um, is one of those things that I think makes it extraordinarily exciting for the students um, uh, today of what they're going to be able to see and experience in their career. Let's go to the postgraduate yeah. realm after dental school. All right. We've set up a dental student here, at least from your university. And I'm super proud to say that you're doing a great job. I mean, it's amazing. So if we got these students graduating, whether the board's required or not, they're going to come out with something that, according to Dr. Stanford here, is the ideal situation. They understand surgical principles. Um, they understand what healing looks like. They understand what an implant looks like modern day. They know how the mechanics of it, and then they know how to restore it to a certain standard. And they understand occlusion, which is key. 
And so we've got these standards from restorative all the way down to the actual taking out the tooth. Then they get out and they find that like, man, I really like surgery, you know, practice for a couple years. They're not 10 years out yet, but they're becoming more, they're getting the reps in and they're, they're seeing some success because they, I mean, I had a, I had a student or I have an associate that graduated from Creighton in the Midwest and he came out with an ex- extraordinary amount of knowledge on just how to do soccer prezzies, soccer preservation. And he's very proficient at it to the point I'm like, man, you're ready. You're ready for this, the mm-hmm. basics of dental implants. So we sent him off to get trained into that. But that's neither here nor there. But where do we go? Because here's, here's the thing. is like at some point in your four-year dental degree, and maybe you did a GPR and even maybe you did an AGD, Maybe you even went to prosthodontic school. But until you get enough reps, it's not really ingrained as second nature in here. Or if you're not attending meetings like John and I and yourself, I mean, we travel across the world to hear the greatest Mm -hmm. speakers and because we want to be influenced by like people, you know, and and really touch them and, and listen to them and spend time. But let's say you're not one of those. Let's say you're going to try to figure out how can I learn more? It seems like it's fragmented. I mean, we were a part of our own, you know, one of our sponsors is something we've been a part of since the inception of restorative driven implants, not to toot its own horn, but it's a big project putting something like that together and for it to be successful. And it seems like there's a fragmentation. What can we do to make this better? You know, this is the problem that I see right now is that I know it's not your responsibility, but I know you have an opinion because you're the editor of one of the greatest implant journals in the, in the market right now in Jomi and the Academy of Osseo Integration, I know is doing some things to help this. So speak to that. So Wes, just so I understand your question, the fragmentation is between what the general practice community is doing versus the specialist community yeah. and making that jump between the two? Well, making the jump between, hey, I really want to incorporate this technique into my practice. Okay. I've decided I really like what I learned as a standard in dental school. I've seen some successes with my surgery and basic surgery. Now I really want to make the investment and actually apply some knowledge and start doing implants on a consistent basis as a general dentist, maybe as a prosthodontist, maybe even as a, you know, someone that finished an AGD that was an implant focused or AGD. Yeah. We're, we're fragmented as far as like a standard of teaching right now. And, it, and it, there's many players in the market. So how, how, do, we, how do we unify yeah. this? Well, um, <laughs> So one of the ways to unify some of the fragmentation, I think, is um, it's an indirect result of the advent of digital planning Mm -hmm. and the digital workflows, because by creating a framework of guardrails um, around treatment planning and, and around proposed surgical interventions that you're doing in a virtual environment, you get some understanding of what you may run into. You know, think of back in the days when, before we routinely use CBCTs, you know, you, you um, unfortunately hit a nerve or you hit a vi- what we used to call euphemistically vital structures, like the whole patient isn't vital. But um, it was one of those things where um, the, the understanding today of that um, I think most specialists, do, the reality is there are some specialists who are going to be grumpy that um, my referral down the street is now placing implants. The reality, once again, is much like my comment earlier about how you treat a patient, they're going to treat you right. It, you know, If you do the right thing, they will treat you well. I think a lot of the large surgical referral practices are realizing that if they treat the referrals right and maybe say, hey, Clark, I, I can see that you're placing implants. Why don't you come into the practice and let us guide and mentor you and help you as a partner rather than an ad- adversarial, you're taking something from my surgical practice. And so in that way, that is a partnership 
Um, and I think back to um, years ago, my brother graduated from Northwestern Dental School that when I graduated from Iowa. He joined a group practice in Chicago of 12 other dentists. He was like in a mini little dental residency for the first 10 years of his career where if he got himself into trouble, there was someone right there he could ask a question and get himself on the, on the right path. I think the, the fragmentation that um, you're, you're hearing about, Wes, is I think two things are occurring at once. One is the implant market from a production side is reaching where you see a large number of implants that look very similar. And there's been basically a commoditization of the market in that way. So that means like, well, everyone can do it. So why can't I? And then what you're seeing second to that is surgical practices that are realizing that they need to open up educational opportunities to the referral base and not keep it just a closed shop um, and in essence grow the entire pie rather than trying to limit the pie using that old analogy um, and i think that's one of the things that i'm seeing in the larger referral practices that are working very well is that they're they're working with their referral base and bridging that educational gap um, you know, John, and I think so our organizations are also a part of that. You know, we talk yeah. about AO, for instance, as, you know, and, and I know that it's, you, you've given a super uh, thorough answer to that. I will also say it's a bit diplomatic, and I appreciate that because in your position, that is a requirement. But I do think that there's also the word standard. And I do think we should, I think you agree with this. I'm not saying this as a counter to what no. you said. I'm saying this as an addition to what you said, that I think that, that we should not shy away from the word standard. And I think that our, uh, at the same time, that we have the ability to teach in some ways more easily, like you mentioned, having digital workflows, the ability to maybe evaluate mm -hmm where we should be placing implants, should we place an implant, and maybe even how AI will uh, be able in some ways to help us to determine whether this is an SAC type of case and simple, you know, advanced complex it's, case. It's, it's already Perhaps, doing it. <laughs> right. We're already at that point. It's already, can, it's already can, doing it, John. <laughs> yeah. We can have data yeah. that, that, that can be, you know, big data is here and we know we can, we can have help to determine was, whether this is a case that we should be whether yeah. we can, we're ready for this, but there's also this component of mentorship. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we've talked about this and we won't dive too deep into this because it's a whole other conversation, but there's a lack of it in our private practice world these days. It's doesn't, it's not impossible to find, but it's more challenging to find. You mentioned your brother's experience of having a residency built in essentially for the beginning of, of practice. And that is what, really we we wish for we wish that every new dentist had that you know that uh that resource of being able to be challenged and being able to be you know have the guardrails but i think we shouldn't shy away from saying our standards must remain high mm -hmm. and if you look at the studies showing the success rate of implants placed by general dentists as i'm sure you've seen they're just not where they need to be now i realize these are not perfect studies they have their limitations but I love what, for instance, organizations like AO are doing by tr developing things like certificates and fellowship programs mm -hmm. and, you know, having the ability to have, you know, somebody that says, hey, I want to make sure that I'm doing this right uh, for my, for where I'm comfortable doing, whether it's restoratively, which is a whole other, we're not even talking about the complexities of some of the more complex restorative treatments that are currently being advocated and advertised. But just even the single dental implant yeah. surgically and how complicated that can be. And I think, you know, at the same time that we have opportunities to maybe help our colleagues make better decisions on what they're ready for, we also have to, to be able to, to have the standards be clear at the same time and say, you know, yes, yeah. you, you may feel you are ready for this and maybe all of the surgical extractions you did for instance, flawlessly, you know, you are ready maybe to make, the, if this is what you want to do, but 
how do you know that you've placed an implant successfully? What are the criteria? As you mentioned, you know, when do we need yeah. to augment and what is, what is the data about this? And, you know, is it okay to just expect people to have to stand in front of 10 very smart people and answer some questions about their case? You know, and I, yeah. and I think that this is what Wes and I started this podcast about. It was not to try to make it easier. The idea is how can we make it better? How can we make what is now becoming more commonplace better? And I think the AO is doing that well. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the fragmentation to some extent can be helped, you know, through what you're mentioning. But I, I think also too, it's embracing standards. It's embracing that as yeah. like being proud of that as an organization so that we can say we are ensuring that we are self-regulating that we are, you know, just diving into that and going, hey, how can we improve, you know, what we're doing? And and I guess maybe as we start to kind of close in on on the end of our time with you, which we've really enjoyed, talk a little bit about that. If you have a, a graduate comes to you and says, all right, Dr. Stanford, I hear what you're These are the things you'd like me to be competent in. And I feel like maybe I've hit those high points. Maybe I, and, and as Wes said, maybe you are ready. Maybe you feel that you're ready to implement or start to move into the next phase of your training surgically. Say that is an implant. Mm -hmm. Where do you point people? Mm -hmm. Where are some of the places that you point people to say, here's where I would go. I'm not necessarily, has to, it doesn't have to just be organizations, although feel free to, to say that if that's how you feel. But what is it? Is it is it research? Is it journals? Is it organizations? Is it mentorship? What are some of the things that you would advise your graduates to 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 pursue if they want to know whether they really are ready to go on to the next step or they or they want to start pursuing that next level of training? So thank you, John. The the best way I think of this is how <laughs> And I'm going to say this in the reverse. When you start thinking about standard of practice, do you know how to get yourself out of trouble when something has happened? So when you say, you know, you're doing excellence in tooth extraction, you're doing excellence in flap, how many failures have you had? And how did you manage those failures? Because if you can manage a something that's going south and save it, hallelujah. If you have a uh, perfectly sutured flap and a day later the patient comes in with a taco chip having torn the entire thing open the, which has never happened by the way um, is you know how do you manage that how do you correct that problem um, and to me when you have a lot of dental students will come to me and they'll say um, or young novice providers they'll say I'm following the checklist I'm like, well, every good chef knows you can go to a cookbook, but the real art of cooking is in the art of knowing what to do on the fly. And that only comes with having failed frequently um, mm -hmm. and figured out how, how you go about. And, I, and a lot of students don't like the word fail nope. because that sounds like you effed up. What I like to use is the term not ready yet. Mm. You are working mm. towards it. You're just not ready yet for that next step. And do you realize you're not ready yet? Um, the definition of someone who uses just a checklist is still a novice learner because that's what you, a checklist is what you do when um, you have a safety protocol, of course, like an airplane, um, and they go through the checklist. That's really just to remind the team what are we facing today and have we thought through contingencies? And when you come to a standard of practice, what you really are is you have that wealth of experience of how to pivot on the fly, get away from the checklist and save the situation as needed. Um, as, you, as you know, when the pilot landed the plane on the Hudson River some years ago, he made a snap decision in a quarter of a second that saved the lives, but he could have just as easily lost everyone. So that was mm -hmm. that knowing the checklist wasn't going to save it at that moment. Scully knew he had to do something was based on a wealth of experience of, and he knew what he had to do for the standard of practice as an airline pilot. We're the same ways um, in terms of what we do. 
Yes. I love so it. That's, and that's where it really reminds me of. Like, dancer. <laughs> oh, it's great. It reminds me of what, you know, Frank Renoir of, of the Academy has mm. talked about this multiple times, you know, about ch the use of checklists as a start and eventually that your brain becomes less and less occupied with each step as, as that checklist becomes secondary to, but that only often, as you said, embracing failure as a, as a means of saying, are you ready? You know, my, a new doctor hasn't had enough failures in a way to be able to know what the biggest challenges are to mm -hmm. the next step. And I think it's wonderful to embrace that as not ready yet. I think that's, yeah, you know, it's well been said, said and, I, and I was just kind of thinking about this. We're talking about failure, and I know that Gen Z and millennials both have a really tough time um, failing. And it's very, they're failure averse, per se. Uh, and, and of the age group, uh, they tend to uh, really struggle about anxiety about failure. And, and I think that, you know, if you, what you're saying is so good, because if you don't, I've always been taught that if you're going to do a procedure, then you need to understand the get out of jail card for that procedure. So for instance, if you're doing the uh, crown lengthening procedure and it's functional or aesthetic and it's involving bone, well, if you're going to do that, then you need to know how to fix the failure of that, which is more recession than you anticipated. So how do I get it back? And you need to know how to graft soft tissue at this point. And so when you hear something like this, you know, and you're like, man, I don't want to fail. And I can remember my associate coming in and just to use as an example saying, you know, I've only placed one implant. I went and got all this training and I'm like, well, tell me what you know. And he knew the basics but there was the nitty gritty details that needed refined. And I just looked at him and I said, I got you. And he was like, what? You got me? And I said, I'm not leaving you. What you're doing is working with me, you know? And that's the part I think that really makes this difficult, especially, you know, someplace like the Midwest, you know, I appreciate Iowa. It's in a more, I mean, you're in a, the Midwest, and it's it's great that you're teaching to such a standard because a lot of these dentists are going to go out and they're not going to practice next to a big city. They're not going to be – they're going to be maybe in a rural area, and they're going to need to understand these standards, and they're going to need to have someone that they can call and talk to, and some of them aren't going to have that person immediately there. So this is a call to dentists that are listening to this right now, okay, that are a little older, that are a little, maybe a little, have a little more gray hair, is that step up and help out our colleagues. We've heard it about our specialists tonight. Now we're hearing it about mentors in a practice stepping up. Mm -hmm. It's just like the endodontist. They went through this period of time where they thought, oh, no, endo's gotten easier and we're going to lose all this business. No, they've embraced it. And now the best minds in the field are teaching it to general dentists. And our specialists, ever since I've been out of school, and I don't do endo anymore, my associate does, but ever since I've got out of school, my endodontists wrap their arms around me and they said, Wes, I've got you. Where I didn't feel embarrassed, I broke my first file. I was telling my associate, I broke my first file in my office manager's tooth, number 19. Do you know how you felt inside when that happened? The anxiety that creeps up? How about when you're placing your first implant and you're like, uh-oh. Um, it just rolled out the buckle plate and into some soft tissue, and now I've got to go get it. And I can't find it. I can feel it, and it's in some space here. And you're like holding on to it. That's never happened to anybody, right? I mean, seriously. <laughs> and you're holding on to it, and you're like, what do I do? Who do I call? But see, that's the thing here is we need people to step up in our profession and grab a hold of these 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 kids. I mean, they're kids. I mean, at my point, I'm 46. But these young clinicians, these young adults, and next level mentorship and really mm. raise the bar. Our specialists need to be doing this and our mentor. And that's a little bit of a soapbox tonight, but I think we've hit on it a little bit, John. 
you know? Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great to, to, to call them out because I think that it's, it's part of what will define the next generation. Yes. And Dr. Stanford, we, we talked about this a little bit. We, we don't even have time to talk about this on tonight's show. We'd love to have you back sometime just to discuss more general ideas about it, about what's happening, trends in dental education, because we do think besides implant education, how things are changing and mm-hmm. what the workforce is going to look like in 10 years or 15, 20 years and, and how that affects what we think about But I think regardless of that discussion and tonight's discussion, the commonality that we can bring from it is mentorship and, and how do we, you know, take those who, who need it and pull them up to the next level. If we've learned something, how can we, how can we pass it on? And I think, again, kudos to you. You're obviously Mm -hmm. doing a lot to, to try to, and I, and I want to give you just a moment as we close to talk about the AO, just because I know you've been involved in the organization for a long time. And I remember, we've shared this before, that the way I got involved in AO was I got the uh, the Dental Implant Student Award when I was at UConn with Tom Taylor. John and Tom I both Taylor, did. And we were got in totally different at, universities. At West Virginia. And we didn't know anything about the academy. No. We were new graduates coming out, and all of a sudden, essentially – this journal shows up in my in my hands and I didn't really know what to do with it. So just maybe speak to as we close what organizations like the Academy of Voss Integration are doing to try to advance the the especially maybe the the general dentist world uh, and, and 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 the implant dentistry world to try to create a mentorship type of focus. So there's thank you. Um... So the best way to organizations like the Academy of Osseo Integration, um, from my perspective, what I like is it is a forum where some of world-class oral surgeons, periodontists, prosthodontists, and general dentists are all in the room together. They're all listening to and debating um, approaches, the science, and sometimes um, the quote unquote uh, failure demonstrations. And there's an open collegiate uh, conversation that's going on. So everyone learns about that in this common forum. The AO also has educational activities um, that are mentored um, that go beyond just an annual meeting. And it can lead to things like um, an advanced certificate or even fellowship or diplomate status that it has. If, as someone moves into the restorative and surgical career, if they want those kind of credentials, they can work with and go through the examination process. And they can really self, it's really a self reward for them to know that they can engage with these um, world-class people who are um, the educators, researchers, and of course, uh, master clinicians that are present. Um, That's what organizations like the AO really provides. In addition to things like the journal and the online uh, information, but to me, it's more of, I'll say this in a nice way, it's a proctored environment because if you go out to um, learn your first implant surgery on YouTube, unless you really trust the source, you really don't know if that's been a proctored and evaluated approach. And is there a consensus in a room of a thousand or 1500 people Mm. that you can see there's a consensus that people, yes, this is the state of the science. This is a state of practice um, or, um, you know, this is where things are going. And so it aspired. Now, for some clinicians, they'd be in the room and they're like, well, I'm glad he can do that. That's not for me. Um, and then there are others where um, they will say, I aspire to what um, Dr. Khan is doing. This is what I need to now do. And maybe it inspires them to go back and do a graduate program if they want, or goes back and doing a mentorship. I'm a big fan to one of your comments earlier. I think, John, you made the comment is get in as a new or early career provider is make sure you get into a continuum course Mm -hmm. um, where you are working with a mentored environment. You can bring your own patients. 
you work with your surgical colleagues, you work with their master ceramists and the technicians, you work as a team, and you go through that first set of cases as a continuum. And there's a lots of these different continuums that are offered around the country. To me, that kind of mentored environment is a key place. And then you can go to meetings like AO and, um, and I, I will argue AAP, the American um, Association of Periodontology, um, the oral surgery implant meeting, in, which is always in Chicago in December, is, is very good. Um, it's sometimes a little bit um, aggressive if you're just getting into the field. Um, but on the other hand, you can see where the field is going. And, and but what I like about the AO is all the players are there. You're not getting a provincial view of the world that uh, oh, it's only surgery, it's only perio, it's only pros. Um, and so from my perspective, that's where I've always enjoyed the meeting. And I can go to a surgical session, I can flip over and go to a total of restorative session, um, um, or I can go and listen to um, what the young new clinicians are doing um, in terms of pushing the edge with what they're trying to do. So that's what I like about that meeting. It's good. We've definitely felt that. And, um, you know, when we, uh, we've been members of the Academy for a long time, and we've definitely felt that it's a great place where they bring so many people of different specialties and backgrounds, international, you know, as well. And it's a place uh, where there's so much collaboration going on. And uh, we're excited about the future of the AO. And and I encourage you, uh, next year's meeting um, is a big meeting. And it's on March 27th through the 29th. And, um, and that's the 2025 meeting. It's one of our favorite towns in Seattle, Washington. Um, will be a great case. There'll be a big international poll there. Um, and uh, super pumped about that. Um, Dr. Stanford, we really appreciate you coming on. I know as a dean, um, you're very busy. And um, I know this is uh, kind of a kickoff with new students um, have started here recently. And we're super uh, pumped for those guys as uh, going to be graduating in, I guess, 2028 uh, would be their <laughs> graduation. And so congratulations to those guys and their accomplishments so far and to you for kind of blazing the trail um, for um, taking it to the next level, John. You know, I mean, the, Dr. Stanford has um, been influential in my, my career um, and um, I really appreciate what he has done to push science and to really give us some of the standards we have today. Um, when it comes to um, implants, rest restorations, and things like that. So I appreciate uh, Dr. Stanford and sure. your contributions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Wes and John. It's been a pleasure to be yep. with you tonight. Yep. We really appreciate your time and, and all of your contributions, as Wes said. And if you have uh, been tuning into this show uh, and uh, have been challenged, uh, hmm. whether that is to – pursue the next level of education for yourself, whether it's to, you know, pursue the, the even just the core competencies that Dr. Stanford mentioned as you, if you're a dental student, just trying to make things better and, and know that it is okay to not be ready for something as well. And how can you get to that point of knowing when you're ready? I think this has been super helpful for me, even in my career, there's always more to learn. And so we really appreciate you tuning in. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe to all the social media channels and, and give us some love. If you enjoyed this show, tell us you want to hear more from Dr. Stanford. So for Wes, Dr. Stanford, I'm John. We are the Dental Guys.